Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ and when a door was open for me and the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Here's my passage. But thanks be to God who always, I want to emphasize that word because the writer in the Greek language emphasized that word. It's really important. Watch this now. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Not sometimes. Always. Got that? It's made up of two Greek words. Pan, which comes from pas, means all or every, and tote, always, all the time, in every circumstance, all the time, and in every circumstance of life. All the time, and in every circumstance of your life. That's a powerful idea, isn't it? Now, who holds up the always is God Almighty. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. God Almighty. He holds up his end of the bargain. This is a promise he gives to every one of us. And that's why you can, you can praise God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. What about Ron Edema? Well, about this for sure, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and, which is an adjunctive conjunction. And what this is, he's connected two important participles. He has linked them, inseparably linked them. The word triumph and the word manifest who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of what? Triumph or victory. Now watch this. He always leads us in triumph and he manifests that triumph in sweet aroma of the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. What place? Every place. Now look, God always, always, all the time in every circumstance of life in every place. You see, it's about God. Not about where you are. It's about God. And wherever you are, God is right there to bring you to triumph and then manifest that triumph in the sweet smell of victory. Because God leads us in triumph or victory. Then he gets to this sweet aroma that he calls a fragrance. Now, what is, the what is the sweet aroma? Tell me, what is the sweet aroma? It is the knowledge of Christ everywhere. Everywhere you are. And you are experiencing the triumph, the victory of Christ in your life. No matter what the circumstances, no, what, no matter what your situation in his life, you are experienced triumph in Christ. And that's a promise. Is that a promise? That's a promise. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Look, God, who leads, always leads us in triumph in Christ, God, who always leads us in triumph. All right. For we, 
are a fragrance, the sweet aroma of victory, but of the knowledge of him in everywhere. For we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The sweet aroma of the victory of Christ in us, which is the knowledge of Christ in us at work in our life, no matter what our circumstances, no matter where our life is, no matter what the place, no matter what the circumstance, we're, we're allowing God, we're following God's lead, who leads us always in triumph and spreads the sweet aroma in that geographical place, both to the saved and to the unsaved. You think how you live is not important to other people in the world? It's important to the church. It's important to the world, how you live, how you live. Now, what he's talking about is living the victorious life. That's a matter of, do you know how to do that? Do you know how to let, do you know how to follow God's lead in triumph so that that sweet aroma of victory spreads? We've recently uh, buried three of our people who did that. We buried three heroes of the faith who did that. Deborah Smith did it. Steve Bryan did it, and Claudia did it. If you knew those people, you know they did it. If you, if, you, if you spent any time with these people, you knew that. For we we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and those who are perishing, the saved and the unsaved. To the one, watch this now, the aroma. The, we are the fragrance of the triumph manifestation of victory in Christ, in our everyday life that we live for the church and for the world before them. To the one, we are the aroma of death to death. That's the perishing. To the other, an aroma from life to life. Those are the saved. Now, don't miss this because you missed it. So don't miss this. The saved person goes from life to life. Goes from spiritual life to spiritual life. Jesus said in John, John the 11th chapter, and it's talking about uh, Lazarus to the sisters. He's not, he has not died. Lazarus, Went from life to life. Lazarus. What people call death, for the, unbeliever, for the unbeliever, he goes from spiritual death to spiritual death. But for the believer, he goes from spiritual life to spiritual life. Eternal life is not something you get in heaven. It is something you get on earth that you have forever, even in heaven. Eternal life. Eternal life is not something you get when you go to heaven. It's something you get when you get saved. John 3, 16, John 5, 24, all of these passages declare that truth. So here we are. So he says to you and I, we are not like many peddling the word of God for money, peddlers. But as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak Christ in the sight of God. We speak Christ in the sight of God. So here's what we're looking at this morning in our study. The fragrance of Christ. We are fragrance. The fragrance is the knowledge of Christ that's being manifested in the triumph of our life in Christ. All the time all the time, every circumstance, and in every place, in the marketplace, in the business place, in the hospital, wherever you are, we are that fragrance. We're a fragrance to the unsaved world, and we're a fragrance to the saved world of what it means to have victory in Christ. Are we those people today? The question on the table today in the first hour, are we those people?
Let's have a word of paper. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to find out. We're going to find out. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. The unbeliever can't understand it. He's a natural man in 1 Corinthians 2.14. You can't speak to the natural man, and you can't speak to the carnal believer. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. I'd like to speak to you as spiritual people, but I can't because you're carnal. What's the evidence of carnality in the Christian life? Is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It doesn't separate you from your family relationship with God. It separates you from the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit called spirituality. If you confess your sin, it removes you from carnality through the blood work of Jesus Christ from the cross and places you back into the indwelling spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is where the dynamics of the Christian life is lived, and that's where victory is scored. This is what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 2. So I'm going to give you a moment through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 to confess your sins, personal sins, if necessary, mental attitude type, sins of the tongue of earth, sins, would be some to consider. Make those confessions according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Third class condition. But here's your promise. If you do confess your sins, homologeo, name, sight, or come into agreement with God, that the sin in your life has produced carnality, and carnality has separated you from the dynamics of victory in the Christian life then take responsibility for your sin and confess it. Name it, cite it, and agree with God over it. If you do, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so, our Father, we thank you today for the promise that if we confess our sins, you will forgive us and cleanse us, the work of Christ on the cross, like in 1 John 1, 7, that now works in verse 9, because I'm a believer in Christ, the blood of Christ extends to my life through confession, not through belief. I don't believe the gospel. I have already been saved by the gospel. It's not a problem about myself. It's not an issue of salvation. It's an issue about spirituality. Make sure our people understand that, Holy Spirit, today in the ministry of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this is part one in this study. I'll cover the rest of it tomorrow. I want to look at the responsibility of ambassadorship in our church. You know, what's interesting is when he says in verse 14, go back to verse 14, but thanks be to God is how he opened this up. You know, what's interesting is the word thanks. In the Greek language, this word is not the typical word for thanks. This is the word, in, in the Greek language, this word is spelled charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, and it means grace. Grace. Grace be to God. Now, normally, we think of grace from God, not to God. And this is why the writers put this word either in your Bible, the word praise or thanks. I want to thank you, God, for your grace. Now, you can understand that, don't you? I want to thank you, Father, for your grace. I mean, that's a, that's a way our prayer should start every day because he has graced our life in so many different ways. Saving grace, logistic grace, supplies your food on a daily basis, your, the health and all these spiritual growth, suffering, conflict in the angelic war the invisible war that we fight every day of our life and the, against Satan and his forces, like Ephesians 6. The word is charos. How can you others say this when you say grace to God? It's responding to the grace that's come to our life, impact our life, and has caused us to swell up for it, to be so thankful about it that when it returns, it becomes a moment of praise. I want to thank you. That's the way we praise him for it. 
That's how you praise God's grace. You thank him for it. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's not meritorious thinking that provides it by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. And that's the way the system works. Thanks be to God is how he opened this up. And the subject matter is like ambassadors, like in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, where he tells us once you become a new creation in Christ, you have the ministry of reconciliation. It is a ministry to the saved, to the world. Every believer is an ambassador. It's one of the 50, it's one of the 50 things you receive in salvation. You're going to never lose in time and eternity. It's one of the 20 status privilege in a little pamphlet. You can pick one up on your way out, the 50 things. You look at the status privilege as one of them is that every believer is an ambassador. And he tells you what it's for. It's the ambassador of reconciliation, bringing the unsaved world through Jesus Christ into a, a forever relationship with God the Father, his Abba Father. And so the subject I want to talk about today is the importance of being an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is one who spreads the fragrance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That he came into the world to die on a cross for our sins, not for his. He was buried and on the third day raised from the dead. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that one has to believe in order to be saved, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 give us the assurance of that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is our message. As ambassadors, we carry the message of reconciliation to the world. It's an everyday, 24 hours, seven days a week business. And wherever God takes your body as the temple of God and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, wherever he takes it, it becomes your responsibility in the supermarket, in the service station, in the school, at work, wherever your body is. That's the word walk, peripateo. Peripateo means to walk by faith, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in every circumstance of, of your life, all your circumstances, all your time, every place. That's what the writer, again, Paul is talking about. And so it becomes our responsibility. This is part of our responsibility. God moves us around the community all every day, all the time to different places looking for positive volition. Positive volition for people who are positive of God and therefore are positive for a gospel hearing. Now what they do with that is between them and the Holy Spirit. He is the power working, Holy Spirit working from our temple to bring conviction once the word of God is spoken under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he brings great conviction about sin, judgment, and righteousness. The Holy Spirit does that. You can be confident he will do it if you present the gospel under the power of the Holy Spirit. He will bring conviction. Your job is not to bring conviction. Your job is to bring clarity of the gospel. He, God opens doors. The clarity of the gospel is what brings people into, into a, a personal father-daddy relationship with God through Christ. There's no other way they're going to get it. And he, every day he sends us out as ambassadors with that in mind. You need to always have that on the front burner. You're not in the supermarket just because it's a supermarket. You're there as an ambassador. God, you need a loaf of bread. Somebody needs the bread of life. He leads you to somebody at the, at the milk counter because they need the milk of the word of God. You move to the meat section, and there's somebody there that needs the meat of the word of God. You're not sent any place for no reason. Even if your reason is to get a, a, a loaf of bread, a quart of milk, and a pound of hamburger. Jesus winds up at the well to get a drink of water and talks about the water of eternal life. Right? Use these opportunities in your life. You are an ambassador. You must keep that on the front burner. You represent God. 
and he wants to spread the fragrant aroma of Christ through your life, the knowledge that you have of Christ. And sometimes it's to an unbeliever, and sometimes it's to a believer who needs milk, and sometimes it's to a believer who needs meat. Sometimes it's a person who needs you to stop and have prayer with him in the middle of a store. They need prayer. They need somebody to put a hand on their shoulder and pull them in and have a word of prayer with them because their heart is broken and they're burdened. And God sent you to be part of that burden-lifting Christianity. This is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about what happens when you become actively engaged with the ministry of reconciliation in your life. Where the triumph is and the manifestation of that triumph as a sweet-smelling aroma to the unbeliever and to the believer. It's based on your knowledge of Christ working in your life. I think sometimes in the church, we get way too comfortable being a priest and ignore being an ambassador. You've got to find that balance in your life the balance in your life between being priestly in the church and being an ambassador to the world. You've got to find that balance in your life. I'm going to give you a 2020 vision for our church. For those who are visiting with us, just hang on. I'll get back to you in a moment. The 2020 vision. You know, you want 2020 vision, don't you? Well, this is the year for it. Everybody this year in this church has got 2020 vision. In 2020, we will make a concerted effort to spread the fragrance of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Sinclair County. We're headed to Sinclair County. Like in 1974, we came to Jefferson County and we spread the gospel completely across the county. There wasn't a high school or a junior high or a college in Jefferson County that we didn't touch with the gospel of Jesus Christ when we moved to this area. It's time to move to Sinclair County. And in 1920, we were going to be in Sinclair County doing what we're responsible to do. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to bomb them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to put the gospel of Christ in 1920 in all the high schools and junior highs, and we're going to put it all over the street. We're going to do that. If I'm, the, if I'm the lead guy of this group, we're going to do that. We are going to do that. We're in the process of doing it right now. We are definitely going to do that in, 19, in 2020. Out of evangelism of Sinclair County, we will start community Bible studies wherever positive volition is towards the Word of God. Many of you have come into this church and don't realize what this church has done over our tour. We have planted 14 churches in the state of Mississippi, in the panhandle of Florida, in the state of Georgia. We've been into Arkansas. We've been all over the place. We have planted churches all over the place. In fact, it was the planting of churches when we first began. It was the planting of churches that are teaching the word of God for spiritual growth, not just planting churches to plant churches like we ain't got something better to do, but plant them so they could take people out of salvation into milk doctrines, into spiritual growth level of maturity. We were all over the place. The lack of having proper trained pastors in the pulpit to take people out of salvation into meat, into milk and into meat was why we started our seminary, the School of Biblical Theology. We started school in 1985 because we couldn't find qualified guys to hold down churches that knew how to take people into spiritual maturity. The difference between milk and meat like in Hebrews 5. So we started a seminary. And we started getting really focused on all of this. It's time to do it again. 
we will be doing it in 1920, in 2020. In the month of January of 2020, we will plant the doctrinal church flag in the Moody area by studying the Word of God on Sunday. We will be out there on Sundays in January. In 2020, we will plant the doctrinal flag by purchasing land and building a place of study and worship in the Moody area. We have been out there, and we have looked at two churches that were for sale. The people didn't like either one of them. And so we're left with no other option but to buy land and build a church. Unless God gives us a building someplace, our eyes are wide open. We're going to buy a piece of land. We're going to build in the Moody area in 2020. In the month of November, December, and January in this church, now listen to me, what month are we in? During the month of November, December, January, we're going to raise $100,000 by a piece of land. In January, we're going to buy that piece of land. So, Merry Christmas. So I'm asking you to become a supporter of raising $100,000 to buy a piece of land. It's going to take that to buy a piece of land out there. And that will be off the grid. <laughs> Buying a piece of land for $100,000 right now out there be off the grid. So I want you to start praying about what amount of money God wants to give it to you. I'm looking for somebody to say, I will underwrite that $100,000 in this church. I want you to be part of this vision. I want you to be a part of it. I don't care if you have a dollar, put it in the plate. Not, not now. We'll, we'll give you envelopes. Well, I want you to first go home and pray about that, and I want you to be supportive of it. We've got to have that $100,000 to buy that piece of land. We're, not, we're, we're going to buy it. And then with the money we get from the sale of this church, we will build a building. We'll put the structure up. We'll put the structure up, and then, and then we'll take care of the inside of it. That's 2020. That's what we're going to do in 2020. You need to be aware of that. That's where we're going in 2020. All right? Everybody, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going? I'm telling you. I have waited to give you the 2020 vision. <laughs> I said, what, you couldn't get more appropriate than 2020 vision. So I've given you a really good piece of information for you to pray about and become very supportive. November, December, and January, we need that money. We're going to buy a piece of land. <clears throat> We're going to build. Okay? We're going to build. We can't find anything we're happy with. We're going to build it. Okay? <clears throat> now, my passage, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, the second chapter, 14 through 17, is a preparation doctrine for this 2020 vision. This passage is all over what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to look big because God is big. God is not a small little guy. He is God Almighty. He's El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. But he works through people. He's a mighty, awesome God, and he will do every bit of this if you'll have the faith. He will do every bit of it, and he'll do it by grace, and he'll do it through you. He'll do it by grace, and he'll do it through you, and he'll do it through me. Now back to my lesson. Back to my lesson about spray, spreading the fragrance of Christ. We're going all over Sinclair County. When 2020 is over, we're going to have war stories. Point number one. Our lesson text is a picture of the Greco-Roman military parade of warfare victory. Paul was a real, a real student of Roman warfare and Greek warfare. It could be led, this parade, he's talking about a military parade like we're going to have Monday. If you've never been downtown on Monday for Veterans Parade, you've got a perfect day tomorrow to do it. 
It's going to be pretty good weather. Let me tell you, I moved, I, I married into a family that had a Second World War POW three times captured and escaped. We had a war hero in my I married into a family with a war hero, Carmen L. Jones. This was an awesome man. And every year that man went down and rode the POW float. And he'd take a grandkid with him. You rode that float, Billy? Yeah. If Deanna was here, she'd say, yes, sir. And if Rhonda was here, she'd say, yes, sir. And if Angie was here, she would say, yes, sir. He was sure to take those kids and ride at that POW to represent the guys who did not come home, who died in prison. I married, I married into that family. What a blessing it was for me to be part of that family. My father was one of the guys who laid in France dead. I found this a great privilege to find somebody who actually got back and escaped from the Germans three times, who had the testimony of testimonies for God, whose faith in Jesus Christ carried him through some of the most terrible times. And this man suffered all of his life from being captured in the winter time three times and escaping and living. Veterans Day. Veterans Day, Monday. Go downtown and watch Veterans Day. Go downtown and watch Veterans Day. It'll, it'll bless your soul when you think about all the craziness going on in our world right now. It'll give you a sense of real Americanism. <clears throat> this is what Paul is talking about, this parade of victory. This is this story right here of coming back. And here's what Paul saw. He saw the emperor leading the parade, the commanding general of the theater of war in the second part of the parade, followed by the field commander, third part of the parade, followed by the real heroes of the war, the soldiers that returned to honor those who couldn't. This is what Paul saw. This is what Paul saw when he talked about it. And he put it into spiritual terms where we have God leading the parade, Christ second in command as, as the th general of the theater of war, the field commander, Paul, and the Christian church following. This is exactly what Paul is seeing when he writes this passage. He, is, he has a picture in his mind of the divine chain of command of the angelic conflict, like in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, put on the full armor of God. In the 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verse 3, Paul shows the divine delegated system of authority. He says, and he uses the word head. Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every room, woman, or divine delegated authority position, and God is the head of Christ. It's God, Christ, and the delegated authority in the church is the pastor under the leadership of the chief shepherd, the chief pastor, the Lord. And so he writes, in the it opens our passage in verse 14, but thanks, karas, thanks, praise. It's the praise. Thank, thank God's grace for victory. Thank God's grace for victory. Listen, you've got something to praise him about every day. If nothing else, praise him for saving your rotten soul. All of the souls that are unsaved are rotten. They're called perishing. Is that not rotten? Well, if you, if you reach in there for that thing that you put in there that's in a perishing, natural perishing, reach in that refrigerator and get it a month later. You know, if you ever drink a glass of sour milk, I'm not talking about buttermilk now, I'm talking about sour milk. You always check milk out after that, don't you? You couldn't force it down my life. But thanks be to God who always 
pantode, who always, that's a temporal adverb compounded, on every, every occasion, every day, every place, every event and circumstance of your life. You got that? Point number two. When there are no spiritual triumphs in Christ in our Christian life, when there are no spiritual triumphs, it shows that we are choosing not to let God lead us in our choices of life, in our choices of our life. Do you understand that? Well, you missed it then, because listen what it says. Listen to what he says. Thanks be to God, whose grace flows to me, and I say thank you. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Who always leads us. Listen, if he's not leading your life every day in every circumstance and every day, you're choosing not to follow his lead. Come on now. Huh? I, I make this stuff up. What's he do? It is God who what? Leads in the triumph parade. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And who manifests that in the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ that spreads everywhere by our presence. What a wonderful idea. You see, if you're not experiencing these triumphs in your life, where at the end of the day you can go like, oh, Father God, thank you so much. You covered me, you covered me so many times today. You've been like that warm blanket over me all day long, Father. Nick, when you're not having this in your life, it shows you're not choosing to allow him to lead. You're not willing to follow him by his will. You got to get, you got to get, you got to get back in spiritual shape, people. We're about to get off the benches and play, real, play the real game now. What I'm asking you in 2020 is going to be one of the most exciting, difficult warfares that you've had in a long time, and it's going to be sweet victory. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, in 2 Corinthians 2.14, how often did God promise to lead us? Always. In what circumstances? All of them? In every place? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 214, two and in every place. What the confidence you have when he sends you to the mission field someplace. God does the same routine. Why? He's in your life, everywhere, all the time, no matter where you are. Are you with me? Listen, we're always in the mission field. We're always on the mission field. Listen. Not on a mission field today, he's got no place to send you. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's how this thing works. Young men are always looking to go into ministry. Listen, the ministry's in you. Where are you actively engaged in it? You don't go into ministry, ministry's in you, it's birthed in you. You don't go someplace to become an ambassador. You go someplace because you are an ambassador. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Who leads us? The promise is that I will lead you in triumph everywhere all the time. I will do that for you if you let me. That's the promise from God. This doctrinal principle should cause us to praise God. What I'm teaching you this morning ought to put praise on your lips to God. You ought to be thanking God. That's what Paul did. Thanks be to God who always leads us. Listen, you get your life engaged in the work of God, and he'll put praise on your lip all the time. He'll put so many joys in your heart, you won't be able to stand them. He'll put so many war stories in your life, you won't be able to tell them all. And it won't be ancient history. It'll be present reality. 
listen to Vine's expository dictionary of the word triumph. I wrote the Greek word down for you. Triumphuo. Those who are led, he writes, those who are led are not captives. The, when it says God is leading us and the fragrant aroma, he's not talking about leading captives. Oh, no, no. He's not talking about captive exposed to humiliation, but rather victorious soldiers on display. It's Veterans Day. Which one are you? But are displayed as the glory and devoted subjects of him who leads the parade. Oh, Vines was all over this because of the Greek word triumph. Note that, in, note that it is God's desire to lead us always. It is God's desire to lead us always. Always, in every time, in every circumstance, in every place, to be triumphal in God, to be triumphal in Christ. Oh, listen. You got to get out of the bleachers, at least get on the bench, so that when the opportunity comes, you can actually be sent in to play. Point three. There's a second present active participle. The first one's triumph, and the second one is manifested. Now, what you're going to miss if you don't pay attention is the word and. The word and. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifest. The word triumph there is a present active participle. The word manifest is present active participle. Leads us in triumph is the verb. Leads us in triumph is the verb. It's a participle. Leads us in triumph. And manifest. An adjunctive conjunction in Greek language put these two together. They're inseparable. They're inseparable. If you get this one, you get this one. When God leads you in triumph, he manifests the fragrant aroma of victory, of triumph to the unsaved and the saved. Nah, come on now. There's two present active participles, leads triumph and manifest. They're linked, they're inseparably linked by the word chi, a conjunction called an adjunctive conjunction. <laughs> That's first-year Greek. It, well, probably second-year Greek, Billy. Isn't it? Probably second-year Greek. The second present active participle is manifest. It is linked to triumph of victory in Christ, manifested, Fanero means to make something visible, reveal it, or display it publicly. Got this parade, and you got the soldiers marching, victorious soldiers, like on the veterans' parade tomorrow. The sweet smell, the sweet smell of the sacrifice and the victory of spiritual warfare. Mr. Jones. He rode that float for the POWs, and he couldn't sleep for a couple of days because of all the names, of all the buddies that he went to combat with and went to the POW camp with that didn't come home. Yet, he rode that float because of the sweet smell of sacrifice and victory. That's what Paul is talking about. No victory without sacrifice. The sacrifice of God's Son upon the cross is where the victory is. The sweet smell of sacrifice and victory of the spiritual warfare is reflected by a thankful heart of God's grace. 
that God would always lead us into victory, always lead us into victory. It is the reflection of staying preoccupied with Christ in our daily life of inhale and exhale of the faith cycle. Like in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Well, that's as far as I can get today. I know I heard silent amens. We are far from this subject being done. This is the church we must become. This is the church we are. We are prepared to be this. We are battle ready. And this is what we're going to bring to Sinclair County. It's what we're going to bring. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and by the Internet. I pray, Father, they would understand this is for their life wherever they are. Wherever they are in the world. Canada, South America, those that touch us. Across Europe. People in Russia and China who listen to us. Africa. May they have battle courage. Put on the full armor of God. This is where the victory is. The triumph and the victory doesn't come without sacrifice. Doesn't come without sacrifice. But it does come with victory. And that's what makes the sweet aroma of sacrifice and victory so wonderful. I pray for that for us, Father. May we be bold with the gospel of Christ. May we understand we're ambassadors 24-7s and always on call. We should be the first responders of the church. Encourage our hearts to be that today. And encourage others who are listening to us across the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.